now that we've talked about some of the more biological components of sleep, that is our brain waves and our need for sleep and what happens when we're sleep deprived, it's now time to talk about a more mystical and eluding part of sleep, and that is our dreams. So we talked about the purpose of sleep as a restorative process to repair our tissues, to help us release a human growth hormone, and to help make memories. But what's the purpose of dreaming? Well, this is something that is still very much up for debate in psychology. Some neuroscientists believe that dreams are nonsense. It's random firings of neurons in our brain that we make sense of based on our personalities and our experience. Some theorists, including psychoanalysts, believe that dreams our windows into our unconscious, where we can see those hidden, deep down repressed memories and thoughts and desires. And lots of cognitive psychologists believe that dreaming is just a process of how we make our memories. It might allow us a chance to relive our day or repractice techniques we were trying to learn. So if you're trying to learn something new, you might dream about it in your sleep. And it's this sort of practicing that helps to cement that learning. That being said, we know that dreams are really fascinating, especially because sometimes they are very realistic. In particular, we know that dreams can sometimes fool us. We actually believe we're awake when we're actually dreaming. This can be especially important when you are seeing things that seem to have all kinds of details. You're at home, you're at school, you're doing something very mundane. It's not fantastical or out of this world. And so it catches you and thinks that this is reality. You might have a difficult conversation with someone while you're asleep and you feel lots of guilt or you feel lots of relief from it. And then when you wake up and realize it didn't actually happen, you might then have a sense of remorse or a sense of relief or a sense of panic. For instance, you might have a dream that you were in trouble for something terrible you did only to wake up and realize you never did that terrible thing. We also know that you may actually dream of waking up. And when you dream of waking up, you think, oh, that was just a dream. Now this is reality only to wake up again. I once personally had a dream where I woke up twice in the dream. And then the third waking was the actual waking. So it's almost like inception and layers of dreams stacked within each other. Sometimes we have what's called lucid dreaming. And this is when you become aware that it is a dream and you can then take control of the dream. So this may be someone who's aware of it, so then they can manipulate their dream. I myself, I've never been capable of that. As soon as I'm aware that I'm dreaming, I wake up. After I watched the actual movie Inception, I wanted to control my dream so badly that I actually experienced insomnia for about a month because every time I realized I was dreaming, I woke up. I know sometimes you might have dreams that are completely out of this world. You might have dreams that you're flying or that you're swimming with tropical fish or that you are uh, seeing someone from beyond the grave, something that could not be possible. Sometimes we're dreaming absolutely basic stuff like trying to type in a password or dial a phone number when we used to dial or even rotary dial phone numbers and you can't get the number and you can't get the password right. That's a very common type of dream for people to have. And a very unusual type of dream for people to have is premonitions. This is the idea that what happened in their dream might actually happen in the future. And so this is the anecdotal story that goes with the, the discovery of the deoxyribose nucleic acid in the double helix. And this is the idea that those who discovered DNA actually dreamt of seeing that double helix structure shortly before they found DNA. Was it a real premonition or were they trying to avoid a plagiarism suit? Up for you to decide. I myself personally, I've experienced premonition three times in my life. You could never predict it, uh, but they have been pretty eerie all three times. One time at which I dreamt a family member would be in a car accident and within a month they were. And it was the only car accident they'd ever been in and that anyone in my family had ever been in. And so there can be some really eerie uh, moments in our dreams. Now, because of the realism in dreams and the fact that they might tell us a little bit about what's going on in our life, psychologists have taken to analyzing our dreams and trying to understand, even when a dream is not so mundane, what does it represent to us psychologically? And so let's imagine hypothetically that you have a dream that you're in the Wild West and you're riding on a train, but the train has a bank robber on it. And just as you're about to go through the tunnel, there's an altercation between the bank robber and a cowboy who's riding a horse outside of the train. So when you look at this dream of the train, what does it mean? Maybe you watched a Wild West movie, maybe you're going to be on a train, or you recently were on a train, but maybe it's something more complicated than that. And throughout the history of psychology, we have seen Freudian psychoanalysts, we've seen Gestaltians, and we've seen modern cognitive theorists approach this in very different ways. 
So we think about the Freudian approach. Sigmund Freud it was very focused on sexuality and repression of sexual fantasies or sexual experiences. So he tended to interpret dreams as being metaphors for our sexual desires or experiences. And if it wasn't a metaphor for our sexual desires or experiences, it had something to do with a power struggle, struggle that we didn't want to admit to or something to do with relationships that we weren't ready to accept. Freud always believed dreams had to do with our unconscious and those buried thoughts. It was never something at the surface and there was always some sort of deeper meaning. For Freud, and because of that, Freudian dream interpretation prescribed that only the therapist, only the psychoanalyst could determine what the symbols in a dream mean, never the patient or client. And so what would happen is the patient or client would describe their dreams and then the therapist would tell the patient what their dreams meant. And they would do this using big lengthy dream dictionaries that you can still buy today. And you could open them up and discover that nearly everything that is long and skinny represents a phallus, and everything that has an opening represents either an anus or a vagina, and everything that is round could be a breast or mammary gland. Now, of course, we know that dreams are not always sexual, but that being said, I firmly believe that Sigmund Freud was alive today and he saw common day text messaging and using fruits and vegetables in a sexual way. Uh, he would nod his head and try and make a dream a dictionary out of our emojis. It can be useful in some regard, but because we know dreams, although often sexual, are not always sexual, it's important also to rec recognize the contributions of Gestaltian psychologists. So Gestaltian dream interpreters would not just say that they were the expert and could decipher the symbols. They believed that the symbols were personal and that they had to ask the client what the symbols meant to them. So for instance, if a Gestaltian person was trying to interpret the train dream, they would say, well, what do, what do trains mean to you? Are trains scary? Are trains fun and adventurous and full of whimsy? What do bank robbers mean to you? Is that exciting or titillating? Or is that very uh, nerve wracking and scary to you? What do tunnels represent? Are you afraid of the dark? Do you like being comforted by a dark tunnel and being in a comfort zone? And so they would want to see what each symbol of the dream meant to you. So in true Gestaltian dream interpretation, what often happens is every symbol, if it's raining, if it's sunny, if it's dark out, every component of the dream, everyone you're with in the dream, everything you're doing, if you're eating, what the different symbols of food meant to you. If you see a big house, are you intimidated by big houses or do you admire them? If you're on a beach, is that stressful or is that delightful? If you see a river, is that calming or is that nerve wracking? And so they would want you to break down absolutely every symbol of the dream to see what that means to to your psyche. And of course, after Freudian and after Gestaltian dream interpretation, then we have the more modern theorists. They're similar to Gestaltian theorists, but there is some major differences. A Gestaltian theor theorist would want to break down every symbol, versus a modern theorist would only want to break down the most common symbols. And a Gestaltian theorist would want to break down everything in one dream, versus a modern theorist is not so concerned with one dream, more so concerned with repetitive dreams or common threads in multiple dreams. So in modern theorists, they would want to analyze what's going on in multiple dreams and want to interpret common threads. Although the dreams might seem very different on the surface, how are they similar? Are you always the hero in your dreams or are you always the damsel or duke in distress? Are your dreams always sexual? Are they always scary and violent? Are they full of color or do you dream in black and white? Do you not remember your dreams or do you always remember your dreams in really intense details? Are you always with the same people in your dreams or people that represent them? Perhaps you have, you're with a turtle, but the turtle represents your best friend. What does that say about your relationship with your best friend? And so a modern dream interpreter would look for those common trends. Myself, as strange as it is, I'm always the hero in my dreams. I cannot be defeated physically in my dreams. It's, it says something a lot about my ego, I think. And so it's the idea, if, are your dreams happy? Are they calming? And there might be something very pleasant happening in your dreams, but you might have a very unpleasant emotion in response to that. And you don't know why. Something could have been totally benign, but you're upset about it. A modern theorist would want to focus on your reaction to all the elements of your dream. So the important takeaway here is there's no black and white in terms of what your dreams are going to mean. More modern theorists believe that they're heavily personalized and it has to do with the trajectory, while acknowledging that they can represent you repeating a pattern or practicing what you did that day it tends to be the theory that most cognitive psychologists hold up in terms of what is happening in our dreams. Now in terms of talking about sleep and dreams, it's important to talk about what happens when sleep goes atypical. And not just talking about sleep deprivation or sleep overindulgence at this point, but when we see atypical pathways in our dreams. 
we know that there are some people out there who experience sleep apnea. Now what's happened to sleep apnea? It is a bit of a neurological atypicality in which they actually stop breathing in their dream, in their sleep. And so their body becomes aware that they're not, not breathing. Their hindbrain alerts that and the reticular formation in the hindbrain will wake us up when we stop breathing. A lot of individuals with undiagnosed sleep apnea don't even know they have it. They go to sleep and they're in bed 10 hours, but they wake up fatigued. And that's because they have repeated episodes of stop breathing in their sleep and their body has to constantly wake up so they breathe and then they fall back asleep as soon as they get their breath. And this repeats over and over again. They might breathe a little bit in their sleep, they only might stop breathing once every hour or once every 30 minutes, but it's a very unrestful sleep. Um, now there's an easy fix for this, and this is to use a CPAP mask where they put on their face and that forces air into them, and so they're able to get a more comforting sleep. There are family and environmental risk factors for sleep apnea, and if you feel that you're not getting a restful sleep even though you think you're unconscious for a long period of time, it, it might be useful to get checked out for sleep apnea. Then we have nightmares and night terrors. There is a difference here. Nightmares tend to peak around age five in childhood, and these tend to be what happens during REM sleep, where you have a narrative that's very unpleasant and very disturbing, and it wakes you up and you're emotionally upset about it. And this can be very problematic for parents who have children who have recurring nightmares who constantly wake up in the middle of the night. Night terrors are a different thing. They tend to happen during non-REM sleep, and it's when they are not even aware that they're having it. Oftentimes in night terrors, they may scream in the middle of the night, and that may startle everyone who's living with you, but the person who's actually doing the screaming and they experience the night terror often has no recollection of having a bad dream or a, or a scary nightmare, and as long as you don't wake them, they wake up fine and, and they're okay. Both nightmares and night terrors might be associated with increased stress, particularly in early childhood and the transition to formal schooling, uh, but we tend to find that night terrors are the most startling to the people that live around you. If you've ever had a roommate or a family member who experiences that in their dreams. Then we also have sleep behavior disorder. And sleep behavior disorder is when the paralysis that's very normative in our sleep doesn't happen. So in stage two of our sleep, when we're supposed to be paralyzed with glycerin and GABA, it doesn't occur. So this allows the person to move. And in the first couple stages of sleep, one, two, three, four, three, two, they're not really moving that much. But when they go up to their first REM cycle, they might act out their dream. This can be very dangerous. They might run off a balcony. They might pretend they're playing football and charge into the telephone set in their bedroom. Uh, there have been known cases in forensic psychology of individuals who have harmed or even murdered other people while they're asleep because of the sleep behavior disorder. So it can be very devastating when that occurs. Now the opposite of sleep behavior disorder is a much more common disorder that you may know someone or yourself may have experienced and that is sleep paralysis. So sleep paralysis, what happens is we experience that paralysis from GABA and glisten, but when we wake up, there's just a few seconds or maybe a minute in there where the GABA and glycerin are still uh, paralyzing us. And so we, our brain wakes up, but we're not able to move. You can't move your hands, you can't roll over, you can't open your eyes and move your eyelids, yet you know you're awake. This can be very terrifying the first time it happens to an individual. We know that it's more likely to happen when you are particularly stressed out, when you're particularly sleep deprived. And so if you let yourself get run down, this could happen more often. There may also be a biological component to it. It might happen more often in families. And it might also happen when you were just waking up from REM, so rather than non-REM sleep. And so simple things to keep in mind is not to panic if this happens to you, that your heart is still able to beat, your lungs are still breathing. I myself started to experience this when I was in graduate school and living alone, and it was very scary when I lived alone and I would wake up paralyzed. Even if it only lasted a half a second, trying to lift my arm off my chest while I was sleeping was very devastating. After a few episodes of trial and error, I learned that my vocal cords were never paralyzed. And although my lips would not move, I could hum to myself to reassure myself that I was alive. It was just a little trick that I would sometimes use that would bring my whole body conscious. Now there are some individuals who experience sleep paralysis who actually say the vocal cords are paralyzed, but that was a little trick I figured out. And another type of sleep disorder I wanna talk about is narcolepsy. So what's going on here, again, in the hind brain of the brain, the one area of the ventricular formation has a malfunction and that's responsible for putting us between wake and sleep 
and it's switching at unpredicted times. So this is when somebody is not particularly tired, they're actually feeling quite alert, and they suddenly fall asleep. And it's unpredictable, they can't predict when this is going to happen. And so this is very problematic. A person who experiences narcolepsy, who's operating a motor vehicle, for instance, could put themselves and others at very devastating risk. Even if they're not going to be responsible for something as life and death as that, they may fall downstairs, they might collapse in a business meeting or a job interview. And so because of this, individuals experiencing narcolepsy, uh, they tend to break a lot of social conventions and experience a lot of social emotional stress because of that. So just wanted to give you a rundown of some of the more common types of sleep disorders. Next up, we're going to be talking about some altered states of consciousness, such as meditation and the use of psychoactive drugs.